Yo, 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 how are you all doing people? Hope you're well and you've had a good month. I certainly have. I've been uh, restoring a bit of balance, as mentioned previously. A um, few festivals, putting on my own events, a bit DJing, and uh, yeah, just generally enjoying myself. Oh, and I've found myself uh, a little lady as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've got a bit of a spring in my step. <laughs> and. The weather is really carpy today, so we're back out on the bank. And we're up at Peterborough, um, the famous Bluebell Complex, which is somewhere I've fished a few times over the years. Um, and it's somewhere I always like to come back to every now and again to have a little dabble. So I'm actually here to fish with a guy called Dave Ball. Now Dave's a bit of a sort of old school underground character from the scene. Generally keeps himself to himself, um, but he's fished a lot of the sort of big fish waters over the years. He's amassed a ridiculous amount of uh, big carp in his album, and I'm sure there's a lot that we can learn from him. So I'm going to be picking his brains over the next couple of days whilst we do our best to try and outwit one of these tricky Swan Lake carp. Um, Dave's fished here a few times in the past, as have I, um, but you know, neither of us have really fished it a lot, so we don't know a huge amount about the lake. And the initial plan, Dave come down this morning to have a little look. We were going to try and fish next to each other just for filming purposes. Um, and there was two good swims, free. So he set his bivvy up in one, and by the time I got here, because he had to shoot off uh, for a couple of hours, by the time I got down, there was actually someone else in that swim. Obviously, it is a first come, first serve basis. Um, so, yeah, I have had a little wander about, and up this end, there's not as many anglers. There's quite a lot of weed, and it's, it's quite shallow up here. Um, I did see one stick its head out after looking for about 20 minutes, and then there was a bit of bubbling in that same spot um, for, well, as I watched it for a couple of minutes, and I was like, right, I've got to go and get a rod and get one on this. So I walked back up, got my gear, come back, and there was still a bit of bubbling on there. So I popped one out with the old bushwhacker, little solid bag, a few little bits and pieces, and a tiny little hook bait. So. Uh, yeah, I thought there might be a chance of a quick bite. That's only been out there about half hour so far, so still might be. But Dave's just returned. He's uh, down there getting himself sorted now. So yeah, I'll probably give it another 20 minutes or so and then pop up, see him, um, maybe have a cup of tea with him. If he's got his brew kit out, I could do with one to be Gasping. And then I've got to get a couple of other bits out of the car myself. And uh, yeah, obviously I want to try and get my rods out nicely for the evening and try and make some sort of plan of attack. But yeah, more on that later. Let's go and see Dave. Right, it's like change of pan. Um, it's getting dark and Dave's got a lot to do. I want to try and get three rods out properly. Um, set some nice traps ready for hopefully well, the night or the morning um, but yeah I don't want to make too much disturbance because there's fish in the area I've now seen five over the last couple of hours around that weed bed um, so yeah it's looking like there could be a chance if I make the right decisions so I'm just going to literally fish for a bite um, each rod's probably going to have a little solid bag on it probably going to put them all out with a bushwhacker and that'll be it, you know. Well, one of them I might just put a little sprinkling of uh, sweet corn and hemp in there. But yeah, just literally a tiny little trap, not a big blatant one, um, and put out as stealthily as I can, and hopefully it's going to do the business for me. But I've literally, where well, I've not been fishing, I haven't got any rigs tied or anything, and like I say, I'm, I'm up against the clock here, so uh, must crack on. fish showing up here last night. Honestly felt like I was gonna get one any minute. Some big ones as well, like proper moving so much water. Um, and about half four, five o'clock, 
middle rods pulled up tight. I've got a pretty much locked up clutch on there. Um, and it still managed to get its head in the weed. And I literally just really slowly, inch by inch, just pulled this big old weed bait in. And uh, yeah, it's a sort of net this massive weed bug um, and then I'm feeling through it thinking, is there even a fish in here you know and then suddenly oh yeah there it is <laughs> always a bit of a surprise in the, in the dark um, so yeah I've just been waiting for this light to get a bit better which it now has and uh, we'll get him out to have a have a look at him um, so probably mid to upper 20 I reckon really nice long one so yeah I'm buzz, buzzing with that result mega result on the first night um, they can be quite tricky in here at times so yeah well happy to have got that one great start happy days right let's get him out Lovely 27 pound Swan Lake Common over the moon with that. Come on a little solid bag, put out with a bushwhacker. Just wanted to be as stealthy as possible. And uh, obviously, because everything's kind of encapsulated in that solid bag, you know that it's fishing all right. You know, I think there's quite a lot of silkweed out there, but it's not super high of silkweed. So uh, yeah, they're still able to find it. He's a cool character here, isn't he? Really chuffed with him. It's a carpet old morning too. I've already had a, another liner, so never know. Could be a good chance of another one yet. Bay's also had a bit of activity around him and uh, had a fish pull his lead off and get rid of the hook. So uh, yeah, it's looking like we could have a chance of another fish or two in this trip. Hopefully, I can get to meet one of the big ones. There's a massive one in here called Dave, so hopefully Dave will catch Dave. <laughs> Right then mate, let's get you back here. Yeah? Cool carp. He's keen to get back. Oh, see you in a minute. Yeah. come to somewhere like Bluebell you've got to expect a lot of people at the end of the day this is you know, one of the best day ticket lakes in the country there's not many places where you can rock up and fish for well 50 pounders um, not just 50 pounders you know there's a massive head of 40s on the complex and I think there's like 50 in four of the lakes which is obviously ridiculous so yeah as a result of that it is a busy place and um, I'll be honest with you, I forgot what it's like coming to such places. I've got a, a guy opposite me and his mate who's about 20 yards away. Last night they were chatting to each other from their swims until half 12 at night and I could hear every word. And then uh, a minute ago one's just showed and I can hear the guy going, come on girl, get yourself up here, we're here for another couple of days. Just want a quick photo with you and then we'll put you back. He's like shouting it across the lake. <sighs> Got a laugh, ain't you? Anyway, um, I've had another couple of liners and there's been a bit of fizzing on that middle rod. I'm not sure I had a fish on this morning, so pretty confident to be honest with you. It's looking bang on. It's quite cool. Um, recently it's been really hot, so yeah, I think this weather's pretty. Uh, CAF to be honest. Let's hope it's only a matter of time. Obviously I've got to get up and see Dave at some point this morning, um, do some filming with him, but at the moment I am Joe Crastinating because I think there's a good chance of a bite. Come on Dave, 
all the I mean there's you've got Dave in here, you got uh is it the perfect common or something like that. And then you've got the box common as well. Um all of them fifty pounders at the right time of year. <sighs> Insane. Okay then, Dave. Now, the people who would have known you from the past are probably quite surprised at your choice of venue for this feature. Um, Why do you like this lake? And you've been here a few times, haven't you? Um, yeah, I probably fish it a couple of times a year. Um, it's just down the road from where I live at the moment, and, and there's a couple of nice ones in it. Um, so yeah, hence why we're here. Right. And so, how have you got on in the past here then? Um, okay, had a few off the top. Couple off the bottom. It's, uh, yeah, it can be quite tricky at times. Uh, so yeah, so you never know. Hopefully, you get lucky. Uh, it's, it's a bit different, isn't it, fishing uh, somewhere so pressured? I mean, even for myself, it's been a while since I've been to somewhere yeah. that's got quite so many anglers on. Oh yeah, it's, um, it's massively different to where I normally sort of fish. You know, like, um, places I normally fish are sort of quite large and low stocked. And, uh, yeah, it's a different world to be honest. It's, uh, but yeah. Well, um, sort of, you know, I thought we'd tap into your history a little bit to give people a little uh, idea of, you know, who you are and, and yeah. you know, what you've, what you've yeah. done in your life, fishing yeah. wise. So, um, yeah, I mean, where did you grow up and how did you get into fishing? Um, I grew up sort of like Guildford area, um, around the local pond, sort of went down there as a little kid. Um, Fishing next to a bloke who, uh, yeah, started catching these carp, and it's the first time I ever see a carp. And uh, sort of, yeah, that sparked my interest really. And I reckon I was probably like seven or eight at that time. And uh, yeah, we used to go fishing like down the, down the river with like maggots and, and that, catching gudgeon and, and whatever. And uh, yeah, I mean, mate started just going down the pond. Probably a bit safer for us at that age um, to be on the pond than the river. And uh, yeah, that was it really. That was, uh, that was my addiction to carp fishing started. Literally strapped the rods to the push bike and uh, go off and pedal down uh, down one of the local ponds. Uh, yeah, good times. Yeah. That, that first guy I ever see catch carp, I, I met him. I started fishing with him a couple of years later, sort of thing. Met him again. He's a few years older than me, and he, he was um, yeah he was well into his carp fishing like in like the early 80s. Sort of um, making his own own boat. Um, then first carp I ever seen him caught. I remember asking what he caught caught them on. His reply was like specials, you know, and it was like a red paste sort of thing. Like, um, yeah, and I ended up sort of like fishing with him. Um, he he would sort of like give me a lift in his car, like take, take us fishing. And uh, as a junior, I'd sort of needed a senior to night fish with. Yeah, so he he was my sort of like biggest influence, I guess. But yeah, good. I probably fished with him up until sort of like mid twenties, sort of thing. Probably a time when I sort of like, well, I suppose my fishing sort of progressed, and then I went to sort of like Yateley. Um, yeah, sort of like fished with him up until that sort of time. Yeah, done all right on there. Was, had a good time. Um, yeah, it was somewhere I never sort of like really, only living like twenty miles away. Never really had that much interest in fishing there, sort of thing. I knew about it. Had friends what had fished there and. Uh, it didn't really, wasn't really any sparks for me, sort of thing. And I met someone, and he, he was like, "Mate, you need to go down there. You'd absolutely love it. Like, you'd fucking, you'd have them, sort of thing." Um, so yeah, I went down there, and it's like, yeah, North Lakes was the one of sort of like basil, obviously. Um, back then, it was almost you caught basil, and that was the key onto the onto the car park lake. So they, they go, allowed you to go and fish on the car park sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I had to walk around um, North Lake and it was like, yeah, actually, and when when I bought myself, left the lake sort of thing, yeah, when I bought my plans, got the ticket, and it was in, in the closed season. And, uh, so you fell in love with the place? Yeah, it was like, yeah, actually, it's got that, that feel to it. Uh, and then I had another walk around just before the start, so it's like closed season and start the season, like June the 1st, whatever it was. Um, another walk round and both times the swim that I've, I fancied was like the point, just one of them, you walk and sit and swim and it's like this, it feels 
there was one right there, 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 or whatever. And uh, yeah, I came out third or fourth out of the draw right for the start of the season. The point swim was free. Um, so I went in there. Um, basically, four mornings later, I had Basil in the net. Uh, it was like, yeah. Yeah, it leaves all right. How did I catch it? Um, so that morning I, had, I caught the pad weight 26, reeled in the rods to do the photos when I got some to do the photos sort of thing. And um, yeah, just recast after having that. Half an hour later it went off. It was, um, yeah, as simple as that. What we'll bait were you on then? I bet you remember that clearly, don't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was bait I used quite a bit, sort of. I probably started using that, that particular bait, about 95. Um, so 98 when I when I had Basil, so I'd been using it for years and, and caught really well on it everywhere. So it's basically um, a squid and octopus, red fish meal. Koi reel, are they? Yeah, 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 of yeah, course. Classic. Yeah, the only one. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, as I say at that time, a um, year or two previous, I'd had like 120s in a season um, from Orchid up in Oxford and another lake down in Surrey. Um, Back then, 120s in season was quite a good, good going sort of thing. Right? Um, so yeah, I had like, maximum confidence in that bait. Obviously, I can catch him basil four days, and having people, obviously the crowd come around, everyone who's fishing. Like, you've got people there who've like been fishing there for ten years or so. They're, like, and, yeah, didn't feel right, sort of like puffing my chest out with like people who had spent so long trying to catch it, sort of thing, and I've just turned up and I like, dropped on it. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I went on the car park and um, basically done a 48 hour. Um, the first time I fished, um, I put the marker flight out there and mate was with me who had, didn't fish the lake either and he was like, is that in your water? And I was like, nah. he's a little bit in front of that swim, there's no one I'm fishing there. And I thought it felt such a nice spot. I just put like uh, about a pound of boilies on it. Didn't put a rod on it because it, it was a little bit sort of in between the two swims. And um, the second night, I heard an absolute kipper like jump out on around where that area was. Um, so I, I had to go that morning. I turned in the evening, and that swim was free, like the one where I thought the area was more in front of. And so I like literally run back to the car, got my gear again. So this is like my tenth tenth day on on on, uh, on Yateley third night on on car park so like quite excited sort of thing like run back to the car got my gear run back cast out found found the spot um it was, it was quite weedy but i was getting a drop through the weed and i had like i don't know I think 18 20 mil boilies and they were firing them out singly everyone was landing perfect on the marker float and um yeah it all, it all just went out perfectly sort of thing and uh, yeah wake up at three o'clock in the morning the rod in my hand uh, to the big orange at 39 I was like, yeah, Yateley's good. <laughs> and then spent the next sort of five years on, on the car park, uh, or the next five seasons. Uh, yeah, good times. Which ones did you end up with? Um, so I caught oh, a big orange, dustbin three times, Heather twice, uh, a pearly, uh, big orange again. So my first fish was the big orange. Um, and my last fish was the big orange. I caught it a second time and I thought. It was just Arthur, was it? Uh, Arthur, single, and chunky oh, were, were yeah, the three. Yeah. And they were the missing ones. Which were the ones I wanted the most. Like single and Arthur um, were the two I wanted the most. But yeah, it is what it is. So uh, did you pull off because they died? or? Uh, no, I pulled off just because five years on there. Um, I say I'd caught Heather twice, dustbin three times. Big orange twice, uh, and when I had the big orange a second time, again my friends who were like taking the photos, I could see, you know, I was taking that capture away from from one of them sort of thing. Uh, I just thought, and other things happen, were going on in my life at the time, sort of moving house and then it's moved to a different area, and it's just, yeah, come to an end on there. Time for a change. Yeah. Um, Is that when you ended up over Sutton then? Um, no, so like the last sort of. A uh, year or two on on the Eightly, I was going off and fishing out elsewhere, going over go at Sutton. Um, I got myself a gold card, so I could fish Eightly, Horton, Sutton, um, and I just sort of like floated around between between the three, whichever sort of seemed 
most likely for a bike. Or by that time, obviously five years on the car park, I sort of knew where where they'd be at certain times of the year. Um, How about so, Sutton? Yeah. And how did you get on down there? Um, yeah, all right. Once once the sort of penny dropped and it sort of like things clicked into the place. It was, um, yeah, it was all right. What I want to know is what you know, gave you the edge um, on Sutton. So um, I sat there and there's a guy who kept going in the same swim. Uh, at, the, at the start of a week, uh, and he would put out his couple of kilos of bait to fish his couple of days. Um, and I noticed at the end of the week, uh, it would be like a jacuzzi over his area, uh, and that happened over a couple of weeks sort of period. I noticed the same same thing happening. He'd, he'd fish, and then the, uh, two days after he'd fished, uh, they, they, they were like going crazy on his bait, and the penny just dropped. He was like, I need to be using old bait. Yeah, it was as simple as that. Like, so, yeah, just washed out, put my baits in a bucket of water for five days. First evening, tried it. Had the brown fish, like, um, which is sort of like one of the one of the rarest ones to catch out of there. And it's like well, I'm the same here. Uh, a couple of mornings later, I had a little gertie. Um, again, a little gertie. I'm at four o'clock in the morning, sort of set up in a swim just as it's starting to get light and I can see like bubbles just about two, three foot out, just like big bubbles going coming up sort of every sort of foot or so. So just like literally load, load a rod down, put the, put the rod on the floor, sat back and uh, it was away sort of as quick as that. Um, so the washed yeah. out bottom baits using on the hook bait? Yeah, yeah, so uh, just meshing, meshing one up. Obviously five days in, in water they go quite soft. Um, so yeah, just meshing one up. Um, so you know it's on there, and uh, yeah, it's good, good method on there. It seems to, um, seem to work. So I, I see it, it's days only. Everyone puts in fresh bait every day. They, they turn up, pull out their bag of boilies and put out brand new bait, and uh, fish just know to leave it for a few days, don't they? It needs to be bait is is the, is the main thing for me. Um, rigs, all rigs catch at the end of the day. As long as you get a good hook hold, that's what you want from a rig, really. Uh, it's not how it sits or any, anything like that. It's, when it goes in that mouth, it takes good hold. Um, so yeah, baits, it, it, and it was, it was about at the bait on there at that time, or what worked. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter where, where you put it within in reason. Um, good bait they're gonna, gonna eat, aren't they? And what about um, like bite times? Um, yeah, they, they did sort of almost seem to know that when the gate time was and almost they could hear the clink of the gate and uh, you'd, you'd reel in, get around to the gate, open the gate and you'd hear them start showing on, on your area. They, they were quite quite um, keen on, on doing that on there. So yeah, sneak on in the morning uh, as quietly as possible. Right? And uh, yeah, sometimes you sort of like trip them up. Um, but again, bites sort of came, did come at any time. Um, I think, I think I say when they're not cautious of, of something, they'll, they'll eat it. Because all they do at the end of the day is swim around and eat, really. Um, they don't, so, yeah, the right thing, and you'll catch them on any day of the week at any time, really. It's, it's like moon phases, so it can be a bit controversial, can't it? So whether, how much of a role they do, do play, um, but yeah. I tend to think like they feed every day of the week, don't they? To be honest, I, I don't really pay that much attention to the moon phases. Yeah, um, obviously it does. Um, I think it affects a lot of the aquatic life, um, like the, the bugs and that, basically. Uh, and I, I think that's what makes the fish go crazy. Yeah, it's a trigger, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. Affecting yeah. The, the tiny stuff. Yeah, so it gets they, they throw caution to the wind when when there's naturals coming up off the bottom. Um, I think that's more what it's about in my, in my mind. Well, I'll tell you what, mate, it feels bang on for a bite, doesn't it? Yeah, looks good, doesn't it? It's, uh... Never know, hopefully something happens this afternoon. Nice sort of low clouds. 
rolling over. I think the pressure's relatively low as well, isn't it? Sort of hovering just over the thousand. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, definitely looks good. That's, uh... And what I love about this lake is you just never know what it's going to be, do you? No. It no. could be an absolute monster. Yeah. Be it a catfish or a cop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the guy down the end just had a big old cat. There's, uh, isn't there a couple of like hundred pluses in here or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd, um, I'd rather not bump into them. No, I had one last year about, I don't know, 110, 120. It was, um, yeah, animal. Giant underwater slug. Yeah. <laughs> Cut up all the weed. You know, like, yeah, just uh, a nightmare. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, obviously, um, when we had a few messages, you mentioned it, and uh, yeah, you, you've been a little bit unwell you know, couple, the last couple of years, is it? Um, yeah, so um, beginning of last year, I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, went through the sort of like the, the rigmaroles of all the treatment, and uh, yeah, sort of come out the other side somehow. So, um, right, so wind back a little bit then. So, I mean, what, what sort of symptoms did you have? Um, just basically the sort of like classic symptoms that, that we all sort of like hear about, um, weight loss, um, sort of like fatigue, uh, night sweats, um, and then eventually sort of, um, my lymph node glands in my neck sort of like erupted wow. uh, and it was, uh, yeah, it's pretty obvious. So it was like majorly wrong. And then it was a, a, a cancer of the blood, was it? Um, yeah, so it was a, um, defused B cell lymphoma. Um, yeah, which is blood cancer, and uh, so yeah, ended up having uh, sort of six, seven months of chemotherapy, um, and followed by a month of radiotherapy. And how was that? Uh, I've heard some horror stories. Yeah, the radiotherapy is truly nasty. You know, people sort of say the chemo is bad, but yeah, radiotherapy was was way worse. Um, I suppose because it's sort of centered around my neck. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to go for that again. Was, uh, but yeah, I'd say, you said to it, it was like, like having your head in a microwave. Well, like yeah, uh, so the radiotherapy, it's, it was um, sort of like 10 minute session every day for a month. And uh, yeah, it, it was basically just like having your head microwave for the 10 minutes. Um, yeah, not, not pleasant. And so. like, how was your mindset throughout it? Because I mean, it must be you know, a hell of a shock. I, you know, I can't um, imagine what it must be like. Just one of them things, it's like, uh, I think it's probably harder for your family and like loved ones than it is for the person actually going through it. It's, it's what do you do? It's a case of, well, you know, it is what it is, just get on with it sort of thing. Um, no point being upset and down down about it if, if your time's limited. Mm. Why do you want to waste your time? Um, so yeah, you've got to sort of stay upbeat and just, just get on with it. Right? Whatever the outcome is, the outcome is sort of thing. Um, so fortunately... I've come through the other side. Awesome. But, um, but yeah. So did you, I mean, did you have faith throughout that the... Or, faith. You know, um, as in, you know, the, 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 the chemo or the different treatments are going to work or, you know, was it... Um, did you have... It was, I mean, there must be a fear factor. Oh, or, yeah, at that beginning. Um, yeah, it's sort of like... Before the chemo sort of like really kicked in, yeah, I've, I thought my days were numbered for sure. Um, probably wouldn't be here now and um, without a doubt about it sort of like going downhill that that quick it was that aggressive wow. um, so when it was diagnosed it was a advanced stage two um, so so yeah obviously stage three is it spreading all around the body um, the stage four is terminal yeah um, so yeah it was quite quite severe sort of thing um, but yeah I don't know I say I just tend tried not to think about it um, and, and just go on with it sort of thing, a uh, bit of fishing, saving grace, so I had to sort of have my own little bit of time and uh, time to sort of like dwell on things and it's, uh, yeah. And you've got a child and a wife in yeah. Thailand. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what, were you planning, did you say you were planning to live there but because um, of the yeah. treatments and whatever it was yeah. easier to be here? Um, yeah, it was sort of like, always sort of like plan to sort of like retire out there and sort of like live a chilled sort of life but um, yeah, obviously life's had different plans and <laughs> yeah, still here, change of plans, so. Well, yeah. I suppose, you know, having, having that is, 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 it must be hard if, if you're, you know, like a lot of people say to me, how could you, you know, give up your carp fishing? How could you, and 
I just think, well, there's there is these other things to life, you yeah. know, and it's yeah. never going um, away, is it? No. Uh, and when I'm out there, I don't really think about fishing because there's so much, so much more to do. Exactly. And you're, uh, doing, you're, you're spending that um, outdoors time, you know, a yeah. lot more out time yeah. outdoors, aren't you? Yeah. And as a result um, of that, you know, you're feeling them natural benefits that we get from being out yeah. fishing just in yeah. your normal kind of yeah. day life. Don't get me wrong, whenever I came back, when I was out there and whenever I came back to this country, I, I got my fishing fix in pretty quick and... Uh, <laughs> But but yeah, actually, when when not in this country, don't really sort of uh, don't really miss it. Um, you said you've been to uh, Gillams, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I have fished Gillams a couple of times. That's mm, a pretty crazy place, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. Jurassic it was, um, Park. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So the first time I fished it was before they enlarged it. Um, yeah, and it was uh, yeah, it was pretty mad. Um, but yeah, I think anyone who enjoys fishing should sort of go there really and, and experience it because. So with having your arms pulled off by a, a Mekon or a Pyro or big old Siamese is, is something else. Definitely. So, um, and then red tails are mega as well, you know, I caught yeah. a few good good ones yeah. there and yeah. yeah. Everything in that lake just pulls so hard. Yeah, it? yeah. Like the first Mekon I caught literally had drag marks on the gravel where it like try to clamp down on it and it's just like dragging you across the swim sort of thing. <laughs> so, yeah, proper power. So you mentioned the uh, you say in your early 40s you sold your house and went travelling? Yeah. So, was that um, like your, your midlife crisis, was it? Yeah, it was exactly that. <laughs> it was, uh, so, yeah, sold my house. Uh, I had plans to sort of like buy somewhere in France, uh, and it was at the time of uh, Brexit, and the pound and the euro, um, the pound crashed against the euro, and so I didn't end up buying anywhere out, out there and just squandered the money and went travelling around the world, basically. Had a lovely time, I yeah, imagine. Yeah, had good fun. What, what different countries did you go to? Oh, uh, so, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Australia, Hawaii, nice. Dominican Republic, uh, America. What was uh, your favourite? Oh, Thailand, I guess. Um, yeah, I'd say, obviously, I, I lived it down. your I, wife it, might be watching. Well, yeah, Thailand, <laughs> of course. Yeah. But no, I lived it down in South France for um, about nine, nine, ten months. I'd say um, South of France and Thailand, two favourite places in the world. Now you, you say you lived in the South of France for nine months, but it was kind of a. Your yeah, I wasn't living in a bivvy on on the lake for nine months. No. I, did, I, did, <laughs> I was living away from a lake. <laughs> but you were there. <laughs> but yeah, I did fish a lot. Cassine. Pretty much, yeah. Um, yeah, I spent quite a few days fishing it. It's, uh, it's a mega place, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you um, love about it? Um, it's just got that whole atmosphere about it. So when you sit there and yeah, take it in, it is, it's just got that special little buzz about it sort of thing. Um, and the weather. I love a bit of sort of 30 degree sunshine to me. Um, so, yeah. And you had a few uh, good ones? Um, yeah, I had them just over 60. Uh, was that that linear one? Yeah. Half linear yeah, type thing? Yeah. The one that Adam um, caught. You had it twice, didn't you? Yeah, I had a uh, 56 at the North Farm and then um, about March time I had it at 60. A lot on the entrance to the west where they move up into the west to spawn. That's a buzz, eh? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's it a bit weird catching it again, sort of thing. Like, it's a few miles apart from each capture, but um, yeah, it's a bit. Oh, it's happened again. But then. Can't help, you can't choose what picks up your bait. It's, uh, Did you catch many in there twice? Or? Um, that's the only one that sort of like jumps out that I've had twice. Um, Any big commons you caught? Uh, yeah, I had a 58 common out there, um, which sort of like at the time was the big one in there, I believe. Um, sort of. So, any other particular places in France that you've uh, really enjoyed? Um, not that you'd want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, there's a few nice places around. Isn't there? <laughs> um, Plans to yeah. go back? Um, probably n not. Well, I'd love to go back, but yeah, I, I can't see it in, in any time sort of soon, really. Uh, Going to be too busy rolling bait, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah. Uh, it'd be nice. I, I do sort of love, I'd love to go a little bit just getting around to it and uh, so I've got, got a few other commitments. So what recently. about your own fishing then um, in the UK? I mean you don't have to name where you're fishing but uh, you've got somewhere that you, you, you know, you're targeting. Um, 
Yeah, it's my nemesis of a lake that I fished for about 12 seasons. 12 seasons, uh, that's a long time on one lake, isn't it? Yeah, I say that's my nemesis. It's, uh, but that's what keeps me going, sort of thing. It's, if it was all, uh, all too easy, it, yeah, I'd get bored of it, sort of thing. But so, I mean, twelve years, yeah, you so. still you still get there, and you're like, right, yeah, yeah. You know, you still oh, get yeah. that buzz, that fire. Oh, yeah. yeah, you get the occasional spells where it's like, oh, I want to die, had enough of it, sort of thing. But no, it's still, um, yeah, no, it's still stoke the fire. Um, well, I know, you know, I know so. what your results are like, so I imagine you've caught most of them. But there must be a few in there that keep dragging you back. Then I guess. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, um, still one or two nice ones. I wouldn't mind. Well, fingers crossed then, this will be your season and you'll have the ones you want. Yeah, but then I'd be like lost for where to go next. It's, oh, um, there's too much water and not enough time. Yeah, you say that though, but I haven't got my name on any waiting lists. Where, and uh, yeah, I don't know where I'd go next, to be fair. It's, uh, You're not I kind of live in my own little bubble. I don't really know what goes on in, in the cart world. Yeah. I don't really sort of like read any, any cart literature or watching these sort of any, any videos or anything like that so I'm just, yeah, just in my own little bubble doing, doing my own little thing um, so yeah I don't really know where where I'd go um, if I was lucky enough to catch all the, the remaining ones I want uh, Thailand probably yeah. <laughs> go down in the south of France <laughs> Well, I popped back to my swim earlier on and uh, I noticed there was a bivvy up to my left and unfortunately the spots I was fishing from this swim were a little bit left off of that weed bed uh, which is kind of between these two swims but they sort of, that swim faces this way a little bit and yeah the guy had two rods where pretty much where I was fishing last night um, not that he knew that and obviously a big weed bed is always an attractive one for carp and carp anglers. Now, when these things happen, rather than get the ump and um, spit me dummy out, I think, right, that's just the universe telling you to move your rods tonight. And last night there was quite a few fish showing out, a little bit more to the right and a little bit further out than what I was fishing. So I had a little flick around with the lead and found two lovely drops, real smooth pullbacks, only about a foot and a half, I'd say, in size, but surrounded by low-lying weed, and both of them measured 11-11. And anyone who knows me knows that 11-11 is my lucky numbers. So, that to me is a sign in itself. I've been blessed, and we're gonna catch a big one tonight. burger. Mexicana cheese, brioche bun, smoky maple burger and a few gherkins. Love them or hate them. A bit like Marmite, isn't they, the old gherkins? So, got a nice bad boy burger. Now all I need is a nice bad boy carp. Pound common. Never caught a fifty pound common, is it? Guys? That'll do. What you got, universe? What are you saying? <laughs> few liners, like savage liners as well, bobbing pulled right up and then straight back down again. I'm fishing sort of relatively sack lines. I think maybe they were just coming through in between um, 
not where the line's going down, sort of closer in. But yeah, there was the odd one showing up here, not as many as the night before, but probably to be expected because obviously there's someone else next door now. Um, but it feels mega carpy. There's a little bit of a north westerly breeze which is kind of blowing up this way. Well, it's calmer at the moment, but there was, and there is going to be today. Um, and yeah, it feels super cool and super carpy. It's been the odd little bit of bubble, bubbleage <laughs> coming up. Um, that feels like there's a good chance of a bite. I'm not sure how Dave's got on yet. Um, so yeah, hopefully he's had a result in the night. I'll go and catch up with him in a little bit, but at the moment it feels like there's a good chance of a bite, so I don't really want to be winding in just yet. Strong coffee o'clock. Amber nectar. Yum yum. Well, mate, you had an eventful night last night then, didn't you? Yeah, pretty, pretty hectic, to be honest with you. It was, uh, landed free, a couple of other light occurrences which didn't materialise, but, yeah, happy we were free. Through your legs and <laughs> that makes you. <laughs> <major. laughs> right, so the third and final one yep. of the morning. Nice, uh, that's a lovely clean fish, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lovely scaly one, isn't it? And uh, so, what was that one? 29? Uh, 29 and a half. There you go. Are they all good scrappers? Um, yeah, all, uh, all got a good account for themselves. No issues with weed or anything? Nah. A couple of old lines on one of them. And I know you've done something a little bit different to the night before, so um, yeah, we'll chat about that in a little bit. Crack of that one, mate. Yeah, lovely, isn't it? Yeehaw. Happy days. Not, not your first rodeo, is it? <laughs> Well, mate, I dragged it out as long as I could this morning, but yeah. um, a bite was not forthcoming. Yeah. <laughs> At least nice. I had that one the first night, but yeah, I don't think it done me any favours, the guy sitting up next door, because uh, a big and jumped right on that spot where I had that fish from the, the first yeah. night. Um, never mind, that's, uh, that's day ticket carping for you, mate. Yeah. Isn't it? You can't choose who sets up next to you. No, no, it's like probably it. my fault for going a little bit left in the first place, but yeah. my weed beds are such a magnet, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Always fish around them. Anyway, you had a, a great night, so uh, yeah, tell us what happened. Um, yeah, quite a hectic night. Uh, had three in the end, a couple of like um, pickups what dropped the lead and didn't hook themselves. Right, now you had that the first night, didn't you? Where you yeah. had, um, had, was it one or two, two of them? Um, yes, yeah, so I've had it four times now. And so um, yesterday you made a little adjustment, didn't you? Was um, yeah, just uh, changed sort of like the hook pattern and um, the size of the lead. And the springers. And the springers, yeah. Um, now the springers is quite an interesting one, isn't it? Because yeah. you don't really see many people using them, but we were talking about it yesterday and it's kind of like, if you're fishing tight lines, really it makes sense to always use something like that, doesn't it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you're fishing just slack lines, the only thing you're relying on is that lead to hook them. Um, but fishing tight lines, like that, as soon as they move that lead, it's, it's this what's hooking them, not not the lead. And we all know they can deal with leads pretty simple, pretty easy. Um, so so yeah, 
You need everything in your favour in this sort of situation. Pretty much, with, yeah. With the barbless hooks yeah, yeah. and finicky carp. I mean, these fish, I mean, yeah. you know, nearly every swim is taken yeah, they're most days. Yeah, so one, they're, it's one in, one out, isn't it? They're about as yeah. pressured as carp can get, aren't they? So yeah. they, they're obviously, you know, very good at dealing with rigs. And so, yeah, any little yeah. things you can do to yeah. put in your favour and are worth doing, aren't they? And yeah. no, it's interesting for me because it's, it's something I've. I don't think I've ever used, maybe I did years and years ago, like the original old ones. I think yeah. people used to make them themselves, didn't yeah. they? Out yeah. of like... Um, out of quiver tips. Quiver tips. That's what my ones are, out of right. quiver tips. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. But uh, it's rare that I fish super tight lines, but obviously there are occasions where I am when, you know, when I'm fishing at range. So I yeah. think it's something I'm definitely going to you know, consider yeah. for the future. So I tend to fish tight lines all the time. Never, never fish slack lines. Even tight lines with a back lead in close. Um, so, that fishing like that in close is absolutely deadly. So, as soon as they move the lead, they've got no chance. I remember reading um, a piece John Harry wrote in um, Carpology years ago, and he was like clipping a lead on to his line sort of after his rod tips. Yeah. Uh, and so similar kind of thing really it was you know the weight was hanging on the line so yeah. that if there was any movement come back this way yeah there was pressure yeah. on it and so the rod tip sort of doing it um acting as the springer sort of thing yeah and, well the lead was yeah. sort of hanging not even in the in the water or maybe it was in the yeah. water but it was hanging tight on the line you know so that lead was giving that resistance yeah. and yeah. and that weight to pull it back this way and uh, he yeah. was you know, saying he was having tremendous results. Yeah. And Same as using a heavy back lead and pulling your tips down to the back lead. So as soon as they move anything, that, that your tip, tips is pulling yes, it up. Um, yeah. It's sort of like creating that hooking. Which Food is, for four. I mean, yeah. Frank Warwick um, yeah. filmed over here with him many, many years ago. Uh, and yeah, he, he was doing the same sort of thing. He was, you know, big, big leads and them springers, which again, he swears by as well. So. Um, yeah, like I say, I'm surprised you don't see more of them around the bank, really. Yeah, they take a little bit of fine tuning and getting you used to them. I think everyone sort of who I see using them fishes them slightly different sort of thing. I like see my ones are like wound wound up as tight as I can get them with the bobbin clips touching the rods. And what ounce leads are you using? Um, I've got so I've been sort of like alternate between a five and a three and a half. So on, on super so, clear yeah. spots, you must have to use heavier leads um, to be able to create that. Resistance. Yeah, yeah. Ideally, you want it just so it's sort of almost balanced. So it's sort of the slightest mo lift of the lead, uh, and the, um, the spring is coming back. Um, so even with a uh, like or, a or if they lift it and the lead falls off with five ounce, the lead drops off pretty pretty easy. So as soon as they move it, the lead drops off, and then um, the spring sort of like clicks home. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah. No, I'll definitely, like I say, it's something that I'll, I'll be thinking about. Yeah. Um, what about rig-wise then, what, what you've been using? And, and like, sort of, well, the situation, how are you actually fishing? Are you finding spots, are you putting much bait out? Um, yeah, obviously I found, found a nice spot to, to put my bait out on. And what kind of spot's um, that then? It was like, I had a, sort of like a half dozen casts, found a clear, a smooth clear area. Had a few casts in that clear area and found somewhere where it had a harder drop. Just put two rods either side of that, either side of the marker float. Um, yeah, important thing, isn't it? Making sure it's nice and clean what, you, what you're fishing on. Um, and what about baiting then? Bait, um, so yeah, I've actually got through quite a lot of bait, probably five kilos, I'm almost through. Okay. So, um, so yeah, they've been munching it. And this is a new bait that you're playing around with? Um, yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, it's along the same lines as the, the Nova B, but Dendrobina worms instead of bloodworm, basically. Um, nice. So, yeah, seems good. I seem to like it. And this is one uh, of the first sessions out with it, giving it a go? Yeah. Uh, well, I've, sort of, I've made some up and sort of like had a look at it, but yes, yeah, first sort of like real session, giving it a go sort of thing. Um, a few chop worms in there as well? Yeah, it's got, uh, again, 20% fresh fresh worms. I mean, actually, what you're putting out, though, yeah. is it or just boilies? Um, a little bit of chop worm. Um, sort of like chopping up the worm and this sort of um, glazing the boilies with, with the worm juice, really. Nice. Um, again, sort of totally natural. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I've smelt the bait and it's, it's, you know, it's got a real nice, subtle smell about it, almost a little bit 
earthy and wormy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, obviously, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of lakes these days, aren't there, that sort of ban natural baits. Um, yeah. So is them it? sort of things can be a big edge, can't <laughs> well, they? Well, yeah, yeah, so it's a boilie at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a massive edge, just they're, um, they're overdosed with chemicals in boats, aren't they, at the end of the day. It's totally different, natural, nothing to repel them. Um, like the, the bloodworm one, for instance, that's, that's what they're naturally tuned in to, to home in on is the scent of bloodworm. So if your boy is kicking off that exact exact same scent, it's, it's a winner, isn't it? Mm. Um, and it's that... that um, so you, you wouldn't want to sort of like ruin it by putting any carp gugs on top of it or anything like that. You want it just natural, as, as say, as they're sort of like sniffing around looking for it. Um, well, we also mentioned, didn't we, um, yesterday you were saying about you know, how they're sometimes kind of just mouthing baits, you know, testing it, if you like. But you were saying quite often with the, uh, the bloodworm boilies, you look at them quite far back. Yeah. And so you just, yeah. like, you imagine them just like... Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, totally. They, they want it. Like that one, really yeah, that one, I'm having that, and it's it's going to, the, to be crunched up sort of thing. It's not just being, like, mouthed in the lips and sort of see what it is. Um, uh, and I, that's the difference, really. There you go. Yeah, if you've got a bait, what they want to eat, you're, you're laughing. Um, yeah. well, well, I'm looking forward to having a little play with it, mate. So, yeah, yeah so you've, you've sold yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be giving it a go, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Right, so, yeah, rig then. What, what sort of rig are you using? Because you, you said yesterday that you tend to just use one rig for most situations. Um, yeah, I tend to just like, use pretty simple rig, to be honest. Um, I, I don't think, say, I think bait's more important than, than your rig presentation. Most rigs, as long as that hook turns, um, most rigs work really. So you've um, got one kicking about? Yeah. So here's the one I tied earlier. There we go, Blue Peter. Get your badge <laughs> later. <laughs> um, right, so yeah, leg clip, bit of yep. leg core, yep. um, anti tangle sleeve, soft braid. Yep. Uncoated braid. What type of braid is that then? Uh, Duo fleck. Duo fleck. Oh, so it's nice and supple, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's exactly what I want. I, again, I bet you really most people's rods and they've got either fluorocarbon or plastic coated hook link. How many people actually use normal braided hook links anymore? Uh, Allows plenty of movement, doesn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. And then a bit of shrink tube and then kind of multi-rig John Mack style. Yeah, the Johnny You've Mack You've got a bit rig. of a funny story about this, right, haven't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come on, I like this. So basically, what was it? You were fishing in Kent, and yep. John Mack said to you... Um, right, so like at the end of the season, he was like, oh, if we don't sort of sit meet each other again, like, it's tradition to like share a rig. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a Kent tradition, yeah, yeah. allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. Like, to find out what rig you're using, basically. <laughs> So I was like, oh, right. and he showed me this rig, and I can't really remember what it, what it was, and I was like, mm, right, what am I going to show you? And I didn't want to obviously show him what I was using, like, so um, I had one of them knocking around, and I'd been playing around with it, but I hadn't really sort of used it much, so I showed him the, the Johnny Mac rig, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple, about a year or so later, he was like, speaking to him, he's like, oh, all the fish I've caught recently have been on that rig. It's like, really? <laughs> uh, he's a shrewd old boy, Johnny Mack, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. I remember Daryl Peck talking about him when he was over um, Conningbrook, I believe it was. And apparently he was like, yeah, come on, everyone would have a barbecue and bought everyone beers and was handing everyone beers all, out all yeah. night. And Daryl said he could see him just sipping on the same beer throughout the whole night, you know, like knowing that everyone else is going to be absolutely battered and not <laughs> going to be up early in the morning. So he'd be one of the only yeah. ones it was. <laughs> You're a shrewd old boy, Johnny Mac. <laughs> About time we got him on the show, actually. Um, anyway, right, so bit of an old school looking hook on there. What's that one? Uh, that is an old Ashima C310, uh, and again, yeah, using since like the mid 90s. Right. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Um, use them straight out of the packet. No need to sharpen. And the hook, so, the bait's quite tight to the hook as well, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. Ish. Yeah. But uh, well, obviously, mate. You know, uh, 
it works for you. You've got a yeah. hell of a lot of confidence in it because you've caught a stupid amount of big fish on this rig, and it's nice to see. You know, it's nothing overcomplicated. Yeah. Right. Simple, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Like I say, ye old faithful for you. Yeah. That's a... I'll just mention this is a, an old rig. This one. <laughs> So, yeah, the the, uh, the shrink tubing's looking a bit battered and the hook's not as sharp as it would be, I'm sure, but, yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'll just put it back in my rucksack for another six months till I want to use it. <laughs> yeah, you'll be chucking that one out <laughs> later, won't you? <laughs> talked earlier about the washed out baits thing and I believe that led you on to a path of sort of designing your own baits and creating your own baits? Um, yeah so uh, back then I'd always made my own bait anyway um, so at that time I'm, I was um, getting bait from Nutri Baits and I'd just get the base mix from them and, and make my own um, rather than have, have someone roll it for me. Um, just, just so I, I know sort of like what's in it and how it's been treated and just gives you that sort of like confidence really. Um, so, so yeah, um, but after washing out the baits, then I thought, why am I washing them out? Why not just not put any, any chemicals in there in the first place to wash them out? And uh, yeah, and that sort of like sort of led on to not using eggs in the, in the bait. So it sort of um, takes on the water quicker, breaks down quicker releases all its all its goodness quicker so so yeah and that's sort of where i'm at today with it sort of thing really with with my bait and and to me bait is the is the main thing obviously you need to have fish in front of you so location but that's kind of a given really isn't it like um so yeah bait bait is the, the main thing for me really I've had an instance where um one one time neutral baits did give me some ready rolled bait um uh, I was using it down the lake and the fish were showing in the swim and it was not a particularly difficult lake um, where you sort of expect to catch one a night sort of thing um, and they were showing and didn't have anything and I went home and rolled exactly with the base with base mix rolled exactly the same bait went down and caught um, so in my mind is that a coincidence or is that I say all, always more happier with a bait that I've made just so I know what's in it really uh, and what sort of like process it's gone through being made. Um, Over the years playing around you've, um, you've got yourself a, a few exceptional recipes and is, is it true you're actually knocking these up for other people now? You're... Um, yeah so um, I've, I've sort of had, wanted to do a bait company for say since I started using this bait um, with no eggs in it and natural, which has probably been about 18 years now since starting using that and realising how different and good it, it can be. Yeah, I've always had in the back of mind to have a bait company, but um, one thing leads to another and it's just getting around to it. But um, yeah, last year it was like, let's have a go at this, let's, let's do it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But looking back in a few years and thinking, oh, I wish I'd have tried that, I wish I'd have done that, um, no good, so. Um, so yeah, at the moment um, I just started with bloodworm bait, so it has 20% um, fresh bloodworm in it. Yeah, and, and so I've started with the best in, in my mind. Like it, it's totally, totally different to sort of everything else out there. So yeah, that's um, it's called the Nova B. The Nova being Latin for no eggs. Yeah, in, in, my, in my mind, I don't think a boiler can get much, much better. Um, yeah, so it's 62.99 for five kilos, um, which. Yeah, it's it, it's expensive when you compare it to a little five pound a kilo bait, but you've got to ask yourself what are you getting in that five pound a kilo bait. Um, I know it costs me more, way more than that um, to make my bait. So yeah, I guess it's that thing. You get what you pay for, don't you? It's the same throughout all walks of life, really, isn't it? So yeah, it's not the cheapest, but it is what it is. If you if you want if you want a decent amount of good ingredients in it, it costs money. Well, yeah, as I say, I look from my Instagram page and majority of them are caught on baits that I've made myself. Um, obviously, there's a few on like tiger nuts and boilies that other people have made. Um, but yeah, the majority of, of them on my Instagram feed are fish that I've caught on my own bait. Um, 
So yeah. And how about mm -hmm. you know like how does it feel to you know let other people use your bait and get you know other people calling you up? Yeah, actually, it's just as much of a buzz as if I caught them myself. To be honest, if if not more. Um, yeah, when someone sort of like phones you up and is excited and like and sort of like telling you that what they've caught. And so yeah, it's a good feeling. It's, um, and yeah. So what have you got a website yet? Or? Uh, yeah, I've got a website, um, baitmatters.com. So with regards to um, you know the what's available, do you produce pop-ups and cook baits and what size baits do you do? Or? Yeah, um, so at the moment, um, just 20 millers. Um, be, again, being a bait that it does because it hasn't got any eggs in it. Although you you get sort of like three four days out of it in the water, um, it does go go soft in that time, uh, and the natural life leeches and snails devour it. Um, so yeah, being a small bait, it, it, it be gone very quickly. So a twenty miller, it works. It is a size where it actually works quite well. Um, so if you get a few leeches like munching away on it you're still going to have something there um, which is ideally what you want to have a carpet of boilies smothered in leeches and snails or carp's going to going to turn its nose up at that <laughs> I'm good in the hood all calm in the farm <laughs> right then mate I've got to hit the road shortly but I thought yep. we'd uh, squeeze in one more chat okay. um, now obviously how long did you say you've been fishing? It's like 40 years, was it, or something? Yeah, as I say, 49 soon, and uh, yeah, so yeah, and you've caught, just over 40 years. Caught a hell of a lot of big carp, done a hell of a lot of fishing. So what I'd like to know is what are the sort of, the key things you think you've learned along the way? That, um, I know it's a bit of a tricky question to throw at you without any prep. Key things I've learned along the way is just enjoy the ride. Uh, uh, that's what it's all about. It's just enjoying it, isn't it? It's, um, so yeah. That's a good one, but I want I want a little <laughs> bit more from you. Um, I mean, you said yourself, didn't you? You know, f like fishing. You know, we we learn bits and pieces ourselves, but we also kind of pick up things off of others, don't we? And sometimes yeah. those little outside the box sort of thoughts, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Of course, you you can learn something off any everyone, basically. Um, yeah. And, uh, you never stop learning, really. Um, so, so yeah. Um, so I, I talk talk to most people, and, and it's amazing the things you do pick up from the most unexpected sort of um, people, sort of thing. It's like, wow, yeah. And they say, just take take that and mix it with a bit of this, and come up with um, a bit of A and a bit of B, and come up with C. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a... It's good to be open-minded, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like fishing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I never do the do the same thing week in, week out. It's always sort of like changing and evolving. Um, yeah. And that's the fun of it, really, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, you know? of course it is. Kit, we're um, always learning, aren't we? Yeah. Every day's a school day fishing, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, well exactly. life in itself, but well, yeah. and, uh, definitely with fishing. Yeah. I mean, even... I mean, it's satisfying as well, isn't it, to... To try different things and and get you know good results as as a result of that. Um, one of the little things that was a little bit outside the box that you talked about, which I'd like to cover, just because you know I like to get people thinking and trying different things themselves, um, was like a almost like a rising zig rig with with paste. Is that right? Um, yeah, something I sort of like. This started using like many years ago and I sort of like a one water in, in the winter sort of thing. Um, yeah, just, um, I think, I think the water actually had a, a, a ban on pop-ups, so all baits need to be fishing on the bottom. Okay. So, so using a sort of so long nylon hook link with a bit of cork tied to the back of the hook and a bit of paste when you first put it in the water, obviously it, it sunk. Um, as it been out there longer, the paste would dissolve and it would, it would come up and become a pop-up, um, yeah, and a deadly tactic, um, sort of, yeah, a winter's day there, you, you couldn't keep your rods in the water doing that, as we're just fishing the boilies, normal rig, you might catch sort of one or two, um, so, so yeah. See, that's something so, totally different, isn't it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Totally different, yeah. and I guess you've got all different sort of combinations of why that 
you know, could work, isn't it? You know, I mean, obviously yeah. the, 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 the movement of something rising up through the water is different, isn't it? That might catch their attention. The scent of the paste as it's kind of coming up and there's that little cloudy stuff coming yeah. off of it. I mean, that's got to grab their attention, hasn't it? You know, yeah. and it's putting that um, attraction in the water column and just sort of turning them on into feeding, isn't it? When they're yeah. sitting at them, to whatever depths they're sitting at. Yeah. And that's yeah. the other thing, isn't it? Is you're finding what depth they're sitting at by having it slowly yeah. rising through the yeah. water, yeah. potentially. So we only sort of fished it sort of like a foot to two foot sort of um, we, we never went sort of like crazy, crazy high with it. Okay. Um, just so it sort of like comes up. up the bottom and, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, again, you know, for, for people who are watching this and they they fish waters with a lot of fishing, um, it's well worth a go, isn't it? Oh, good, yeah. It's like I've yeah. always wondered about using a, a, a drifting controller float with a short nylon hook link with like a couple of maggots on it, you know, so it's almost just yeah searching them out yeah. <laughs> you know? like a drift float with I've never, bait, with yeah, bait, it? yeah i mean if you're on the back of the wind obviously you could use the wind to, to drift out yeah. and keep a fairly tight line where you wanted it but you know if you were just moving that around or letting it naturally move around you you know you're kind of searching them out naturally aren't you it's something that you'd feel a bit stupid trying but if you tried it and caught loads of fish on it yeah yeah and you'd so, be happy as larry wouldn't you yeah it's totally different um yeah and Definitely um, worth a little try. But you didn't, um, you know, I mean, you also didn't you take that somewhere else and give it a, uh, was it um, Dinton or something yeah, like that? Yeah, a couple of other places, like, um, I had um, a bite, a couple of bites out of Dinton using it. Um, used to fish up at Orchid many years ago, had a couple out of there doing it. Um, but, yeah, so just one of them good things to try occasionally. And so how exactly were we setting up then? Like a bit of cork on a hair with paste wrapped around it, um, or just cork yeah, on a Yeah, so hair? imagine a, a knotless knot, as it were, um, with a bit of cork, squared, squared off bit of cork, so some sort of rough corners and rough bits on it, rather than just a cork ball. Um, tight to the back of the hook sort of thing. Uh, and yeah, just mould your paste around, around a bit of cork. Uh, a bit around the shank if you want, sort of thing. And uh, yeah, over, put a good lump on so it sinks. Obviously, you want enough cork that it'll, it will sort of like lift the hook and that, and with a bit of paste. Yeah, and as the paste breaks down, it just slowly comes up. And as I say, on well stocked waters, it, yeah. I mean, I remember even just uh, layer pits, you know, when we used to, well, when I don't know who started it to start with, but fishing zig rigs and spotting over the top of them. Yeah. You couldn't use two rods because you put one out, you put three spots over the top and it was away, you know, you literally couldn't keep one rod in the water. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, so yeah, some, something just that little bit different that they've not seen before. Yeah. They seem to treat food that's in the water column like, a lot differently, don't they? Like, as safe food. Yeah, I, I think they just, they know it's sort of safe, don't they? Um, they're conditioned, aren't they? Um, to, to the way we all fish for them. Um, so yeah, something a little bit different normally trips them up. Yeah, awesome, uh, I like that, yeah. definitely. Like I say, uh, food for thought. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> right mate, well, I've got to get going, um, but you're gonna stay another night, aren't you? Yeah, enjoying it so much down there. Well, I don't so blame like, you, three fish last night, coming yeah. up to a full moon, you've got the spot rock yeah. in. Yeah. I reckon there's a good chance you could have a whacker tonight. Never know. I'd love to stay, but I've got an edit to get out this weekend and uh, still got a bit of editing yeah. to do. Failing that, it's just a nice place to be, isn't it? It's well, in this weather as well, la yeah. lapping it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you never know. Awesome. Well, best of luck with your nemesis. Yeah. Thanks for uh, coming out and uh, doing a bit with us. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to, to seeing how the bait goes because, you know, obviously we talked a lot about it off camera and it is tricky in in a way to trying to get people to you know be sold on the whole kind of what you pay for what you get yeah but i think the results will speak for yeah. themselves and um and also it's a different principle of manufacture i say that that's what the the biggest difference is you know, we've been making boilies 40 odd years with, with eggs there's nothing to say that that is the be all and end all, no. or even the, sort of the best way. He's got kind um, of potentially reinvented the wheel, mate. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, 
but yeah, just the way it reacts in the, in the water. So it, it's leaking off all its goodness from the moment it's in contact with the water sort of thing. And the pictures um, you showed me of all the, um, the natural food, you know, just on yeah, it in no yeah. time and yeah, the devouring the smells, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they actually do eat it quite well, I like to say. Um, like you say, you know, that in itself is, is an edge, isn't yeah, it? Because yeah. you're drawing in the naturals, which the carp love anyway. Uh, you're making it easy for them, the, the carp, to get to those naturals. And then you've got all that other lush goodness with, you know, such quality ingredients that you know that they're going to get that feel-good factor and just want more of it. And yeah. I'm not surprised, you know, what you said about the old deeper colds and that, yeah. because once yeah. they know what it is, uh, they want it. Yeah, yeah. Not any don't show any caution towards it sort of thing and uh, yeah, so uh, game on. And I guess the other great thing about that is, 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 you know, it's an instant bait, isn't it? You don't need to apply loads of it to get it working. Exactly. You could put a single out there and that could be a bigger edge. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but yeah, quite excited about the new one that I've been using this um, this trip. Yeah. Um, to sort of have that sort of action on it yeah that's it mate yeah i mean like when you get a, i mean it must be satisfying to have an idea put it into production and then you know one of the first trips yeah. out on it it's it's proven itself and yeah. like i say it wouldn't would not surprise me if you messaged right. me some point in the night or in the morning to say you've had a whacker yeah it was a good one jumping around early hours this morning um so yeah, hopefully it'll return tonight. I'm sure if you had three last night, there was probably a couple of whackers feeding in amongst yeah. them. They just the cleaner yeah. ones got there first. Yeah. The early birds right. got the worms. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <yeah. laughs> awesome. Yeah. Right then, mate. Well, thanks again. And best right. of luck. And uh, yeah, yeah, I look forward to having a little play with the bait. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, two that I can come to mind. Only two, I think. One was at the same lake, Stance at Abbots, where we, we messed about with Alf, uh, Angus. And the second one was a bailiff. Now this bailiff was a nice fellow, but he was a nuisance. And um, Terry Gabrielski was fishing with me at the same time. It was the same year that we'd done all this messing about with Alf Angus. And uh, anyway, we're in the pub. And uh, I have been wrong in this, on this, so I'm gonna tell you a full story. So Terry Gabrielski had a girlfriend with him and we were all in the pub and we'd all jollied up and uh, he left the curry house was across the road. We left, he's coming out with the curry. So I've gone in there with the bailiff and I said, yeah, well, it's in our clothes, mate. I said, no, you ain't. He's just got curry now. I said, I want a curry, mate. And when I've had a drink, I'm a, a nightmare. People that know me will, will know that. I'm sorry about this, but I'm a nightmare. So I said, anyway, the waiters started coming out. I said, what, you all want to fight? Something like that. And then basically they said, all right, we'll give you the curry. So I said, not only that, I want a bottle of that wine and a bottle of that wine. So uh, they give it. Anyway, on the way back to the lake, this baby's giving me a load in the ear hole. Bosh, 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 bosh. Anyway, I dropped one bottle of wine while he's talking to me. I said, right. Anyway, we got back to my motor. It was a full moonlit night. And I, I put the bag and the bottle on the motor and I could just see through the, through the glass the glint of this knife. The geezer pulled a knife on me back. So I just turned around, grabbed the other and smashed him to the ground. And um, I said, if you get up while I'm still here, I'll, I'll smash your face in. Anyway, he ran away. And then as he's running away, he said, I'm going to get my mates. Oh, we're going to come back and beat oh, I thought, oh. Anyway, so I'm fishing just past Terry Grebioski. I said, listen, mate, I'm expecting some aggravation tonight. I said, do us a favour. If anyone come past you, just give me a tweak on the buzzers. Just do the buzzers a couple of times. So I sat there all night, and I had a, a Bowie knife, which I only ever used to use for cu cutting branches. I've never used a knife on anybody in my life. So I stuck that in the ground, and I sat there for a couple of hours, and I thought, well, they ain't coming now, are they? So about 3 o'clock when I got to bed. So I'm up early the next morning, I've took the knife out of the ground, put it to the side there. And all of a sudden I see this humongous keys are coming along the bank. I said, he said, uh, you Richard McDonald? So I got up, I said, yes, mate. So I got up. He said, right, I said, listen, mate, you want to hear the story here? I said, the geezer, uh, what I've neglected to say, oh, no, because it haven't come up yet. The geezer pulled a knife on me. And when I hit him, because he pulled the knife, he ran away saying, I'm going to get my mates. 
and I only wanted to play splits. Right, listen, mate, I'm 40 odd years of age. My game of playing splits was over 25, 30, 40 years ago. When you were kids, that's what you do. You throw the knives at your feet and then you have to move your foot until you can't stretch them no more. He wanted to stab me in the back, mate. So when he heard my story, he said, well, right, fair enough. Anyway, he told me that I'd knocked his, uh, broke his tooth. So I said, well, because Elf Engers used to know a good uh, dentist. And when I told Elf Engers about it, he said, well, when you see him, tell him to come and see me and I'll get his tooth done for nothing because it, it was going to cost a thousand pounds. That's what the bailiff said. And then when he, I met the bailiff again, I said, hey, listen, go and get your tooth done. Go and see Elf Engers. He'll get your tooth done for nothing. He said, it's going to cost a thousand pounds. I said, no, well, if you go and see him, Get that anyway, whatever happened to that, because I didn't go fishing there after that anyway, because I lost the fish, which is another story. But I lost the fish, so I didn't go back anymore, so I had no more contact with the bailiff. So I hope you got your teeth fixed, mate, if you're there. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Love it. Okay, new feature for the show. Seasonal tips, something we can do each month. Um, whether it's a tip from myself or one of the anglers we're out with, I'll try and do it each time. So at this time of year, my best tip would probably be, don't bother, stay at home in the warm. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Um, this time of year, it's really worth keeping an eye on the bird life, uh, coots particularly. Wherever they're working is probably the most rich area of the lake. They'll be working the weed beds that have got the most food left in them. So that's always worth keeping an eye on. But also, if there's carp in the area where the coots are, then you'll know about it if you keep an eye on those coots. You know, they react, they spook from fish, uh, they look down, they look a bit, you know, scared, uh, or they fly away quickly. And same with your spots, you know, sort of keep an eye on the birds moving around your spots. And sometimes they'll drift over, look down and absolutely freak out and quite a few times in the past on like a snake pit I remember you'd have that and then you'd have a bite lot, not long after. Um, so yeah it's a little confidence booster obviously to know that there's fish in the zone and at this time of year fish don't tend to show a huge amount in the daytime. You might get little windows in the morning and the evening but throughout the day um, on a lot of lakes they don't tend to show a lot so you might think they're not showing but if you get yourself up in the night, sort of, um, I find like midnight is sort of the time when they quite often start showing, but sometimes it you know, might be two in the morning, but yeah, try and get yourself up and about at night. Um, even if you're not fishing, you know, wander the lake at night and, and listen, you know, and if they're showing, sloshing about, then obviously you can locate them and you're sure that you're on them rather than just playing a guessing game and being on them is everything even if you just fish sort of you know like solid bags or single look baits or whatever um, and you know you're in the zone where they are and quite often at this time of year that's when they're doing their feeding so if they're sloshing out they're probably uh, having a munch out as well so yeah try and be a bit more nocturnal if you can and try and keep an eye on the birds um, the other one is at night time, when a fish shows, not just night time, any time actually, when a fish shows and if there's a coot near it, the coot will f spook, you know, and they make this mad squawking noise. And then all the others tend to react to that as well. So listen out for that, and that can give the game away as to where the carp are showing when you can't actually see them, is uh, everything at night time. Right. Please, fish, can we have a bite? Because this is getting a bit painful now, I won't lie. <sighs> Gotta keep on, keep on going on. Keep on keeping on. Gotta keep on, keep on, keep it on. Keep on, keep it on. My three favourites. To be honest, I've probably got about five or six that really stand out when I jog back my memory over the last sort of six, seven years. And the best one has to be, it was in the early days, probably maybe the second year of me carp fishing in London, and it was a park lake. I'd seen a few really cool pictures of the lake, massive, I'd walked around it, it was busy, and I went down there pre-baiting, put a load of bait in, and I kind of felt a little bit like, 
it was going to take me a while to sort of figure it out if you like there's really long deep bits shallow bits certain bits you couldn't fish and i turned up on my first session was with the dynamite boys i think we'd just done three nights on a canal caught absolutely nothing so for the final night i said let's just go this part lake we might catch a few and i got the rods out and within 10 minutes i hooked the target fish the one that i actually wanted the most could call it luck, but I'd put a lot of work in going down there baiting, so I'll, I'll class it as skill anyway. But no, obviously luck was on my side, and that was a really cool mid-30 scattered old zip linear from one of London's Park Lakes. So that has to stand at number one. And the second one, taking you back even further, was one of my first ever campaigns. It was on a gin clear stretch of Canal in London, and it was really close to where I was studying. I went to Performing Arts College and right in the middle of the city, this really small stretch of canal, crystal clear, not that many carp from what I knew. And I remember going down there and tip fishing, there was like big bream. And when I was younger, I used to tip fish and do matches and stuff. So even the big bream appealed to me. And I spoke to one of the regulars and he said, there's a few carp. And I was like, really like thinking, surely not. It's tap clear, you can see everywhere, but these fish are nice and uh, um, it's tap clear. You can literally see everything. but these carp find places to hide under the boats and stuff. So I took his word for it. I come down, baited a couple of areas, and me and my mate went out. We did a night, literally slept on the floor with socks on, just lying on the concrete, and I caught a 25 pounder. And from there on, I was like, I'm gonna catch this big one out of here. Like this guy was telling me about a 28. And I did loads of nights, probably three, four after that, didn't catch anything. Um, ones were shown, sorry, off putting. <laughs> and yeah, I just carried on grinding away saw this fish eventually in the water and the day i caught it i just remember being like so happy it was probably the first fish i'd ever sort of seen a picture of seen in the water and then gone on to actually catching it so it was a unique little story with it being close to college and it was a really old like wiry 28 pounder jet black from this part of london so yeah that has to come in at number two number three would obviously have to be the thames 40. again i was living close by I have to say, if I wasn't, I probably never would have had the opportunity to catch it. I was living like a 10, 15 minute bus from this nice little sort of slack area off the tidal Thames and got told by a few of the locals, there's a few nice carp in there. I remember going there on a hot day and seeing a couple and I was literally like, what? Like massive fish, like 30s, 40s. One was bigger than the one I actually caught. I did loads of nights, didn't catch anything at first and was thinking I was going to sort of be a long campaign. And then the first one I had was a 20 pounder and the second one was 41 pound. This massive big slab had it on the mat. And I remember saying like, that's gotta be 50 pound. I was FaceTiming my mates, like absolutely buzzing. And obviously out of the tidal, a fish looked really old like that, of that sort of size. I, you could argue that that is probably my best capture, but it's sort of not just about the fish and how they look, it's all about sort of the, the journey and the adventure getting to that point. And I think, one, two and three, that's sort of the order they go in, but there's a few others as well that are special ones that I remember. Right, well, unfortunately, that's it for the November issue, and I must apologise for the lack of diary piece. I have been out having a little go, but unfortunately, I didn't catch anything. I just didn't feel like there was enough of a story there to put it on the show for you guys. Um, and girls. <laughs> right, before I go, I'd just like to say a massive thank you once more to everyone who's contributed in the last month. Um, big ups yourselves. Obviously, there is a little bit of incentive. I appreciate they're not the biggest of prizes in the world, um, but it doesn't seem to make a big difference for, for you guys anyway. You seem to contribute whether there's a prize or not. But with that in mind, I have still secured three prizes for this month. So we've got 48 hours at Ashbury Fisheries for two people and if you want to fish the top lake you can or if you want to fish the, the mere you can, that's totally up to you. I've also got five sets of the corns to give away, so one in each of the sizes. So you've got the standard size corns, two sizes, then you've got the super corns, two sizes of those, five sets of them. And then lastly, but definitely not least, we've got 10 kilos of bait matters, no Nova B to give away and some hook baits as well. So seeing us talking about this bait on the show, it is a little bit special and it's well worth checking out. So if you fancy winning yourself 10k of that, then you can. All you've got to do is contribute five pound or more via the PayPal link, which you can find in the details below, or just type in the address that you can see uh, now. Massive thank you to you all. I'll be back in four weeks time. I'll see you then. Oh, and how mild is this weather? It's absolutely insane. Get yourself out angling before it gets cold. See you soon.